This program contains graphic descriptions and images of the results of torture. Viewer discretion is advised. In mid-July 2003, more than 200 U.S. soldiers surround the house in the northern Iraqi city of Mosul after receiving a tip that high-ranking members of Saddam Hussein's deposed regime are holed up inside. When the occupants refuse to leave, a ferocious four-hour-long firefight ensues. Later that day, after troops storm the house, Word comes from Central Command about the results of the raid. Four persons were killed during that operation and were removed from the building. And we have since confirmed that Uday and Kusay Hussein are among the dead. Two days later, these gruesome pictures confirm the identities of the dead. For many Iraqis, the death of Hussein's two sons is cause for celebration because under their rule, Iraq had become a living hell. And, many Iraqis say, the wanton cruelty of Uday and Gusei Hussein surpasses even that of their fathers. For these brothers, simple torture is not enough. Uday and Gusei bring in big cats to torment one prisoner. They would bring a cage with wild cats, big cats with huge claws, and strip the person naked, cover their head, and leave him with four of these animals. Hit the animals, then blood would be running in streams from his body. Then they would bring salt and put it on the wounds. This man watches as his brother suffers a terrifying death at the hand of Gusei. Gusei came to our region. He took my three brothers. He put one of them with nine young men from our town in a burning pit. Hussein's two sons are vastly different from one another. Each embodies distinct and terrifying traits of their father. But they share one grisly similarity. They are expert in extreme acts of torture and murder. They really fully been prepared to oppress and kill the people and kill anybody standing in their way. And they are worse, much worse than their father. But it's all a devilish family. It is a family known to employ any means necessary to ensure its survival and dominance. Perhaps most importantly, it is a family built on ancient customs. It is a lesson passed on to the sons by their father. Trust in his tribe is a lesson Saddam Hussein learns early in life. Shunned by his mother and forced into a life of petty crime by his abusive stepfather, the young boy falls under the influence of an uncle who passes on his deep sense of mistrust and animosity toward other people. He despised the weakness. Uh, there was strength in, you know, in fear. By the age of 20, Saddam Hussein is a killer and thug and beginning to rise through the ranks of the newly formed Ba'ath Party, where his talents as a hitman are put to use against political enemies. This was the way you take power and you keep power. Saddam's mistrust of anyone outside his tribal circle in Tikrit may be one reason he follows tradition when choosing a wife. Saddam was married to his cousin. The reason for this marriage between cousins was, you know, 
it was the importance of the tribal unit or the family unit. You know, you shore up, you make it even tighter by having everyone marry each other. And that's what Saddam certainly believed in. Sajida Hussein gives birth to Saddam's first son, Uday, in 1964. But the infant's father is not there for the happy occasion. Saddam Hussein is in prison for his revolutionary activities. When Saddam was a young politician, he worked very long hours. He was in his office at dawn and worked till late in the night. The children would have been brought up under the care of their mother, but like a lot of Arab women, she would have indulged the boys a lot. Um, as a consequence of which they had no real discipline. Over the next few years, three more children, all daughters, are born to Sajida. Saddam's daughters, Rina, Ragab, and Hala, uh, were also favorite children, but they were never given the duty that Saddam expected of his sons. Instead, he wanted them to grow up normally and to make good marriages. Saddam grooms his sons to follow in his footsteps. Uday and Gusey are raised in a climate of violence and fear, created by their father's use of murder and torture to achieve and sustain his ascent to power. It is said that the boys, when they were young, were taken to see the torture chambers in Baghdad as an afternoon treat, and Uday in particular said to have relished the experience. But, ever mindful of his public image, Saddam presents a completely different picture to the outside world. In the public images of him as a father, he tried to depict himself as a good father looking after his sons and his daughters, turning up at birthday parties, showing them how to shoot, showing them how to swim. The image he wanted to display was that of a good father. Well, Saddam's firstborn son enjoys a favorite position. Uday was definitely Saddam's favorite child. The boy clearly favors someone else. Uday was very close to his mother and very protective of his mother. As they grow, the personality of each boy begins to emerge. They're very close, the boys. Uday, you know, was a flamboyant, kind of psychopathic, you know, but very sort of loud, violent character. Kuse was like that sort of shy and retiring one. In school, they enjoy unique privileges. The boys went to the local schools, but they went to school accompanied by bodyguards. Um, Uday in particular used the bodyguards for his own effect. If he got into a fight at school, um, he would make sure that the other boy would be pinned back while he beat him up, uh, and the bodyguards made sure that nobody intervened. Uday even shows up at school wearing a bandolier festooned with bullets. In contrast, his younger brother keeps a low profile. Chrisai was a more studious boy um, and paid more attention to his classwork, as a consequence of which he developed into the smarter of the two boys. Gusey asserts himself quietly. By the time Uday reaches college, his eccentricities have blossomed into dangerous behavior. It is during the early 1980s that the first reports of his killings surface. He had his own bodyguards, his own uh, way of doing things. Most of us also knew that this family, whatever they want, they're going to do it. And if somebody doesn't do it, they will just execute him. Aziz Altai is a classmate of Uday's at the University of Baghdad and witnesses Uday's obsession with sex tinged with violence. There was a lot of fear in the female students that the guy had a repetition of choosing the most beautiful woman uh, and trying to uh, force her to date him and then in most cases he, he will execute her or let one of his bodyguards kill her after uh, he raped her. So that was uh, evident and there was a lot of fear when he was coming to the college.
Despite Uday's penchant for violence, the full force of his brutal and unpredictable nature still lay just under the surface. In a few years, they will explode, unchecked, as Saddam Hussein's oldest son transforms into a monster. Time they enter university, the personalities of Uday and Gusei Hussein, the sons of Saddam, are clearly defined. Uday, the flamboyant egomaniac, exhibits the traits of a psychopathic killer. Hussein, the quiet younger son, prefers to remain in the shadows. But the brothers have one thing in common. From an early age, both displayed the violence that runs through the family like an indelible stain. By the time Uday was in his late teens, he would use violence as a way to, to get what he wanted if it wasn't offered freely. He was also using violence against his own associates. When they crossed him, he would order them to be beaten, even tortured, imprisoned. Kusai was probably more controlled, but equally was being trained to use the apparatus of the Ba'ath estate, which his father ran, and that meant being willing to use violence whenever it was required. In 1979, Saddam takes control of Iraq, naming himself president. But his intoxication with absolute power comes at a price. Saddam became a womanizer, and he started uh, having mistresses, and he neglected his wife, Sajida. And of course, this built up a lot of resentment towards him within the family. The tension at home may contribute to Uday's outlandish behavior at the University of Baghdad where showing off takes precedence over education. He always wanted to dress good and, you know, have the best cars. It was all about show business, more than being a student, actually. There's often the obnoxious rich kid in the class, but not every obnoxious rich kid can have the people he doesn't like executing. In 1984, Uday Hussein graduates with a degree in engineering reportedly fluent in both French and English. Saddam appoints him to his first government post, head of the Iraqi Olympic Committee. First thing, he's stupid. Oday is in the Olympic Committee because he's son, uh, Saddam's son. Rahid Ahmed is Iraq's best weightlifter when Uday takes over his team. He forces the athletes to sign a paper stating how they will finish in upcoming competitions. First, second, or third. If you don't have any medals, they're gonna send the joke. Athletes who fail to please Uday are sent to the private jail Uday has constructed in the basement of the Olympic Committee headquarters. They put me in the jail. I get in the jail seven days. Many are beaten, urinated on, even shot. The soldiers are done and shot me in my back. And, uh, and this hole in the side in my chest. Uday was a psychopath when it came to anything he touched, and in particular when he was running the sports department at the Olympic Committee. He wanted to win all the time. Well, in sports you can't win all the time. But when the Iraqi football team, for example, lost, Uday would inflict quite incredible punishments on them. He would lock them. In this, in this iron chest and leave them there for hours at a time in the midday sun. It didn't improve their performance, but it demonstrated to the Iraqi football team who was the boss. The abuse is so intolerable that in 1996, more than a decade after Uday takes charge of the committee, Raed Ahmed will defect to the US during the Atlanta Olympics. When he look at just your face or your eyes, if he think you may be doing something, he didn't ask you nothing, just he killed you. Uday Hussein sentences him to death in absentia and imprisons Red's entire family, including his nine-year-old sister. After two weeks, they are released, but remain under party surveillance for years. Uh, Uday, Uday, he don't care about people, you know. He, he think all the people same like animals. Whatever he wants, he do it. In 1988, Gousset is named deputy of the Olympic Committee and makes an official visit to President Hosni Mubarak of Egypt. But on October 18th of that year, 
his older brother commits a crime during a reception for Mubarak's wife that nearly costs him his life. During the party, held on an island in the Tigris River, Uday Hussein becomes enraged with Kamal Hana Jejo, a close friend of Saddam Hussein's who serves as his bodyguard, food taster, and sometime pimp. Uday blames Jejo for Saddam's many mistresses who have made Uday's beloved mother so miserable. When Jejo begins firing a gun into the air in traditional Arab fashion, Uday sends him a message. He told the bodyguard to go back and tell this ass to stop it. Latif Yahya, once one of Uday's body doubles, is there. The bodyguard relays this message to Kamal Hana. Well, Kamal Hana told him, I don't take orders from brats. I only take orders from the president. Uday had this German made, this special stick with a very sharp end, which he used to unpluck flowers and give to girlfriends and so on. He went straight to Kamal Hana and hit him on the neck with that stick. Wounded, Kamal Hana fell on the ground and Uday then took the pistol and shot him. Uday's father rushes to the scene. Saddam, Khan. Saddam Hussein was furious. He told him, if Kamal Hanna goes, you go. Uh, and Kamal Hanna died that very night. Saddam wants Uday executed, but Sajida intervenes. So Saddam has Uday and all of his entourage jailed at the notorious Ragwaniya prison outside Baghdad. Uday himself was actually tortured. He was beaten up by a hand-picked attachment to the Republican Guard all from different units so they wouldn't know each other and it would be harder for the day to exact revenge at a later date and he was beaten really severely this was the watershed where he changed from merely an unstable murderous thug to a totally off the wall wild psychopath who had simply no control at all this was the moment when he became a truly frightening human being as Uday carries on his reign of terror it is clear that his younger brother, Gusei, is emerging as Iraq's next despotic leader. The kind of ruthlessness, the kind of cunning that was involved. Now, I think those were qualities that you could see in Gusei, who had his father's quietness, determination, cunning, and sense of survival. By 1989, Gusei is being groomed for power in Saddam's special security unit, working under his brother-in-law, Hussein Kamal. Hussein Kamal was very, very deeply trusted by Saddam. He was the person who was in charge of the uh, bio and chemical weapons programs. He had a lot to do with the nuclear program as well. So he was a very powerful man. But in 1990, Iraq's power structure is in jeopardy. That August, Saddam Hussein's army invades and occupies neighboring Kuwait. Comes the Persian Gulf War turns into a costly defeat for Iraq. The rout of Saddam's forces leaves much of Iraq in the hands of the Kurds in the north and Shia Muslims in the south. The Shia have long been persecuted by Saddam, who belongs to the ruling Sunni Muslim minority. The Shia were a great threat to the same family and wanted to overthrow the secular regime of Saddam and establish an Islamic government in Baghdad. Gusei takes charge of crushing any hope of a Shia revolution and shows no mercy. Shia neighborhoods in Baghdad are shelled indiscriminately and thousands of Shia are thrown in prisons like the infamous Abu Ghari. Here, many are subjected to horrifying forms of torture. When we were in prison, the way they tortured us was to mount a motorcycle piston on a long metal rod with a wooden handle. They would heat it on a stove until it became red. Then they put it on your stomach until the flesh cooks. After six months, my scar was still oozing with pus. For Gusei, Uday, and their brother-in-law, Hussein Kamal, nothing is too extreme when it comes to protecting the family's turf. Kusai and his uh, associates employed um, 
attacks it's reminiscent of the Nazi SS, taking whole families out from their homes and machine gunning them to death. Five brothers in one Shia family are lost to Saddam's murderous regime. Two were executed together. They bring them, put together side by side, and they shoot them together. But the worst is yet to come. As Gusei takes more and more prisoners, he finds that he has no place to put them all. Hossein came into the prison and he saw the prison is full and he had new prisoners of Iraqis he wanted to put. So they have no room, no place. He told them, clean him up. I have 2,000 prisoners coming. He said, what do you want us to do with this? They, he told them, just kill him. Uh, tomorrow morning I need it empty the prison and they told him we cannot do that without presidential order he said kill him and I'll bring you the order and he did kill him he killed 1,000 of him at noon time and he came back at 4 p.m. and he killed the rest of them and he killed almost 2,000 of them this is in Abu Ghraib prison an untold number of Shia are executed and buried in mass graves many are buried alive I saw with my eyes a group of young men who were brought in uncovered trucks. They put them in the trucks alive with ropes around their necks. And they put them in a hole dug by a backhoe and buried them alive. With an enormous toll in human life and much of their lands destroyed, the Shia are broken and Gusei is handsomely rewarded by his father. Within a year of that uprising, which was March 91, Kusei was in charge, was supervising all the intelligence agencies. He'd rocketed to prominence in that time. In the years after the Persian Gulf War, Kusei is given the task of thwarting efforts of UN inspectors to find and destroy Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Meanwhile, Uday finds ways around the strict sanctions imposed by the UN to enrich himself. For years, Iraqis are prohibited from selling oil. But Uday arranges for tens of millions of barrels of oil to be smuggled out of the country to willing buyers. This paid for the regime. This gave them the cash reserves to pay their guards, to build their palaces, to buy their weapons, and keep the regime in place. Uday is obsessed with money and what it can buy. He has an extensive wardrobe of flashy designer clothes and a king's ransom in jewels. He owns more than 1,000 fancy cars. And in his palaces, there are rooms used to store stacks of money. He is also rumored to use heroin regularly. But all of this does little to stem his feelings of paranoia. If people were rivals to him in business or in some way making his progress difficult, then he would just ask his brother to have people arrested. The flow of prisoners were arrested on Uday's orders, but arrested by Kusei's people was like the flow of oil. And by that he meant, you know, these were people who would never be seen again. These were people who disappeared. These were not people who were released after a finite period of time. Gusei continues to do his brother's bidding, imprisoning, torturing, and eliminating anyone Uday finds to be a threat. But when Uday becomes suspicious of his brother-in-law, Hussein Kamal, it is a very different matter, one which threatens to turn brother against brother. Poisoned by jealousy and ancient hatreds, constant infighting is a way of life. But Uday brings a new level of violence to their already vicious rivalries. By 1995, he has become so volatile that even a petty squabble with an uncle named Watban Ibrahim Hassan becomes a murderous rampage. He actually raided a party where his uncle Watban was present and sprayed the party goers with machine gun fire and actually killed a number of gypsy dancers, which those guys always had at their parties, and um, wounded his uncle very severely. The injuries are so serious that Watbam Ibrahim Hassan, Saddam's half-brother, has to have his leg amputated. Saddam, who normally encourages Uday to murder, unleashes his wrath on his oldest son. 
Saddam was so enraged that uh, he went to the garage where Uday kept his fast cars, a collection, a vast collection of Ferraris and what Porsches and what else, and he ordered that the whole thing be set alight. But his father's fury seems to have no effect on Uday, who continues to target relatives who irritate him or get in his way. He often discredits them in his newspapers. Uday had this weapon, which was his press empire. I mean, he was the, the Rupert Murdoch of Iraq, if you like. And he had newspapers, radio stations, TV stations, and he would use these for his own political ends. And so he was attacking various members of his family in 1995. During this period, no one piques his jealousy and ire more than his cousin and brother-in-law, Hussein Kamal who is married to Saddam's favorite daughter, Radha. He is head of the Republican Guard and in charge of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. Jealous of Hussein Kamal's power, Day sets out to bring him down. His men just went through everything to spy on the same Carmel to get the dossier of dirt that uh, Uday would, would present to his father. And by the way, Hussein Carmel was doing exactly the same thing as far as Uday was concerned. Through his spies, Hussein Carmel learns that Uday is about to report the fact that Carmel has stolen millions from the government in weapons deals. Afraid for his life, Hussein Carmel packs up his wife and children along with his brother, his brother's wife, who is Saddam's daughter Rana, and their family. They all defect to Jordan. We are working for covering the regime. In an effort to secure asylum, Hussein Kamal gives Western intelligence agencies a treasure trove of information about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. To this day, it is the key source on the subject. Saddam is furious and blames Uday. He thought he'd betrayed the regime. Saddam wanted Uday to make amends, and so he asked Uday to kill them. But Uday must first lure Hussein Kamal and his brother back to Iraq. He chose uh, a trusted intermediary to make a series of promises that he knew he had no intention of keeping, that uh, they would be completely safe, that they would be respected, and all they had to do was come back to the welcoming bosom of great uncle Saddam. Despite the protests of his wife and brother, Hussein Kamal agrees to return to Iraq. They were met at the Jordanian border by Uday with a, with a group of bodyguards. The moment Uday saw them, the, his sisters, uh, Rana and Ragda, were separated from their husbands, put in a separate convoy and driven to Baghdad. Saddam forces his daughters to sign divorce papers. He wants the same from his sons-in-law, who are holed up in a family villa. Uday arrived with a special unit of the Republican Guard. With a loudspeaker, they say to him, you have to divorce the girls, you and your brother. They are, you have to divorce the girls. If you accept this, this is your last chance. And instead of answering them, he shoot them. Uh, they surrounded the house and they bombarded it. The fierce shootout lasts 13 hours. When the house caught fire eventually, uh, the brothers-in-law and their father came out to surrender and they were gunned down. Hussein Kamal dies. But today's men continue shooting. After they kill him from a very, very uh, near distance, they shoot him a lot. Many, many, many uh, bullets in his body. And he's dead, just swimming with uh, a lake of blood. The main killing was undertaken by Uday. But the one thing that Chris I did was to take a video camera and record the whole thing. He then took the video back to Saddam so that Saddam could see that both brothers-in-law had been killed. Despite the removal of his chief rivals, Uday still has many enemies. And believe me if I say everybody in Iraq knows Uday and hates him. One evening in December 1996, a group of plotters almost succeeds in assassinating Uday. They know he will be driving to a party in the Mansour district. There was a sports shop on the corner. 
So they were wearing sport clothes and had sport bags with the guns in them. And they waited, and sure enough, along comes Uday in his Mercedes. And Uday usually drove himself. So they opened fire on the lead car, on the driver, and sort of shred the driver. Then they noticed one of them suddenly realizes that it's not Uday. So one of them ran around to the other side of the car, and there was Uday trying to get under the dashboard. So he fired and put eight bullets in him, so we hear. And then they got away, amazingly. They actually had a good escape plan, and they got out of town. Rumors are rampant that the shooters are backed by relatives or Iranians, but they are actually Iraqi citizens members of a group called al Nada. The people who did this, you know, they were just, you know, decent middle-class people, just committed sort of, you know, patriotic revolutionaries who just wanted to get rid of the dictatorship. Uday, riddled with bullets, is rushed to the hospital where he faces months of surgery and rehabilitation. While he is still recovering, Saddam convenes a family summit at his bedside. This is a rarely seen videotape from that day in 1997. Well, Saddam reads in the right act. Uday, he said, Uday, like, you, can, you can really sort of see it, you know, poor Saddam, so sort of shrugging this, his terrible elder son. He says, what are you? Are you a businessman? Are you a, a playboy? I mean, he says, you've done, you know, you've done incredible harm to the country. I don't know what to make of you. You, you just, basically, he's telling me he's been a disaster. He was quite clearly now totally out of the running as far as the succession was concerned. Life will never be the same for the oldest son of Saddam. Uday was mentally scarred as well as physically scarred by this attack and he never really recovered. He ended up with several bullets in his body, uh, one of which was uh, supposedly lodged near his spine and could not be removed. The result was that he was paralyzed or semi-paralyzed from the waist down. Since this assassination attempt, he is seldom be seen to be standing up and even more seldom seen to be even walking. Being crippled and cast aside by his father doesn't make Uday contrite, only more vicious. It is supposed that he, he will change for the better, but he, he changed to the worst. He became more cruel, wicked. Beatings, the tortures, the uh, short detentions in prison became um, uh, more frequent. All of Iraq believes Uday's injuries have left him impotent, and Uday feels he now has something to prove. He was able to have sex again. But in fact, he found it much more difficult, and he seems to have developed an obsession with very young girls, with virgins. He had an arrangement with principals of high schools from the poor areas of Baghdad to send girls as young as 12 or 13 to him, which was really pretty grotesque. But he certainly doesn't limit himself to young girls. It seems clear that he was, you know, he was a sort of sex addict. I mean, he had to have women all the time. I mean, he was... You know, we're talking about an unstable character. There are many examples, many cases, of Uday being at nightclubs, seeing a pretty woman with a man, and having the man killed. If life was cheap to Uday before the assassination attempt, now it means nothing. In one incident, he goes fishing with dynamite and spots a swimmer on the other side of the lake with one of his kills. Uday shouted out, don't touch those, they're my fish, and the guy didn't hear him. And uh, as he continued to swim with the fish, Uday just picked out one of his powerful guns, the 44 Magnum, and shot him. Now, no one is able to stop Uday's wanton killing. Not his uncles, not his father, not his assassins. In the end, it will take an invasion to bring him down. When the second Persian Gulf War begins, coalition forces make it clear that Uday and Kuzey are almost as important to them as Saddam himself. Well, the U.S. You know, named uh, the Saddam sons, Uday and Kuzey, as high on the target list because they were seen, quite rightly, as, after Saddam himself, the major pillars of the regime.
There is evidence that Saddam and his sons made extensive preparations before the war to ensure their financial survival. In a final act of thievery, Jose masterminds one of the biggest bank heists in history. At dawn on March 18th, Gouze and other Iraqi officials arrive at the nation's central bank with a document signed by Saddam demanding the withdrawal of one billion dollars in foreign currency. Bank director Azrar al-Basri processes the request. I followed and executed the orders. You have received orders from president of Iraq. You have to open as a, an officer. Over the next four hours, Jose and his gang load up $900 million in $100 bills. Uh, this is the way that Saddam ran the country. He used the central bank as his personal pocketbook. And a lot of the, the key figures in the regime were paid in cash. Although much of the cash that was stolen from the Iraq central bank has been recovered, approximately $100 million remained unaccounted for. More than enough to keep Uday and Kusay on the run until Allied forces finally hunt them down. We have no doubt that we have the bodies of Uday and Kusay. We use dental records to identify the bodies. Despite rumors that they have moved around the country using numerous safe houses, it turns out Kusay and Uday numbers two and three on the coalition forces list of the 55 most wanted Iraqi leaders have been hiding out for three weeks at a lavish house in northern Iraq. There's a 15 million dollar reward for each son and it's widely believed that the owner of the house, a Hussein sympathizer, is the one who ultimately decides to cash in. We had had an Iraqi citizen walk in and give us information that Uday and Kusay might be located at this residence. Over the course of the night, we plan our operation. The next morning, troops from the 101st Airborne enter the house and are greeted with gunfire. After the battle rages on for several hours, 10 tow missiles are fired into the house. Missiles finally silence the sons of Saddam forever. Uh, this will prove to the Iraqi people that uh, at least these two members of the regime will not be coming back into power, which is what we've stated uh, over and over again. And we remain totally committed to the Hussein regime never returning to power and uh, tormenting the Iraqi people. There are few people in human history who have committed as many murders, as many outrages as these two men, Kusay and Uday Hussein.